Well, my dear listener, it is an honor to be able to stand here with my Bible open and with some notes that I have asked the Lord to help me to give to you from His Word. And I'm going to do that. If you recall, I recently just preached a sermon for you that had to do with the book of Jude. And we used, of course, as I'm going to use today, verse number 20. I'm going to give you some more thoughts because we're talking about the work and the labor that a Christian is supposed to produce, in which I have been pastoring for many years. And I'm just being frank and very honest with you. I do not know very many Christians who are laboring and working, as Jude puts it, in their Christian life. God knows if there's ever been a day like today where we need to apply ourselves in the work of God. We are His workmanship unto good works. But I don't see it happening very often in these days. We have become so lax. In fact, I'll be honest with you, don't be offended, but I'm just going to tell you. When I look at the average member in the average Baptist church today, I can almost doubt whether or not they have truly ever really been born again. Because if there is a Holy Spirit, and there is, and if He lives in the Christian, and He does, then He is the motivator, He is the producer of good works. Now let me just read to you again, if you want to find it in your Bible, you may, and check me out. Just don't take my word for it, take God's word for it. I can lie, but God cannot lie. But I want to give you what God says, who is not a liar. And here's what he said in Jude. There's only one chapter in the, in the book of Jude. And God put it toward the end of the Bible, just before the book of Revelation. And the reason being is because God saves the best for the last. And here's what he said in Jude, one chapter, one verse I'm going to read is verse 20. Here's what it says. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, if you listen to or if you have recalled the sermon that I preached not long ago, I talked about how much labor it takes to build anything, whether you're going to actually build a house or a shed or build something as far as a furniture piece or whatever it is, building. It takes planning and it takes work. And the Bible is telling us here, you're the beloved, I'm the beloved, and we're to build up ourselves. It takes work to build. No wonder the Lord said, upon this rock I will build my church. And He's still building it. And look how long it has taken Him. Over 2,000 years, and He's still building. Why? Because building takes labor. It takes work. And he tells us right here that we're to be building or working at building up ourselves and our most holy faith. I hope you get this. I honestly, really, truly want to help somebody to understand what condition and what position they are in right now as far as their Christian life is concerned building up yourself. And then God gives to us those things that have, have to do with our building. He mentions right here, building yourselves on your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Ghost. So we're supposed to build up ourselves. How are you going to get built? By the builder. Who's the builder? Jesus. Where do we get the construction uh, uh, place where we can look to see where to build? In the Bible. I mean, you take somebody that's going to be able to uh, build a house and all. He has all of it laid out for him as to where everything goes and how to do everything. And that's exactly what God's done with this Bible. So let me give you something that I think is absolutely, totally, completely, 100% one of the most important things I could ever preach to anybody, and especially to myself and to you. And that is, we're not only supposed to labor at building ourselves, but we're supposed to labor at building prayer. I know you hear a lot about that. You, if you go to church at all, your pastor constantly is no doubt in encouraging you and requesting prayer. But honestly, now let's just be honest. How many of you sit in the church and that prayer request is made that you really, truly labor at praying for that request, regardless of who it is? Because prayer is labor, it's work. And so if it's work and labor, in this society today, nobody wants to work, and not even the Christian, when it comes to working at prayer. And I want to tell you something. I've been around for a long time. I've been a Christian for over 60 years, and I'm going to tell you something. Prayer is labor. Prayer is work. But prayer has got to be worked and labored to be able to accomplish anything. And that's the reason why our condition of our country and our churches are in right now. Because it's work and it's labor and a Christian does not want to get involved in work. Look what it says here. Listen to it again. But ye beloved, that's the Christian, we know that based on other scriptures in the Bible. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, let me tell you something. You can't pray in the Holy Ghost unless the Holy Ghost has control of you. Because I could take you to Romans chapter 8 and tell you that it's the Holy Ghost who takes our prayer and addresses it to the Lord on our behalf. We really do not know how to pray or what to pray for, but the Holy Ghost who knows us and knows what's going on around us and knows what's going on in this world, the Holy Ghost that lives in us knows so he, we might make a mistake in the words that we would say in prayer, or we might not be as sincere as we ought to, but the Holy Ghost that's in us, if we're praying in the Holy Ghost, we'll take it to God and give to Him the accurate truth if we'll labor at allowing Him to have control of our prayer. I'm going to show you some verses here, and I hope you'll listen to them. And God only knows, I hope you'll even look at them and mark them and go read them later if you can't look at them right now but labor at praying, praying. I know, like I said before and just said earlier, we hear about prayer all the time, but we don't do it. We don't labor at it. We want everything soft and easy and smooth and not, not, not going to take any exertion at all. We, but we need to labor at praying. Now listen to what I have to say here. If you are a stranger to real prayer, you are a stranger to real power. Why? Because the power comes from the Holy Ghost that we're supposed to be praying in. And so if you're a stranger to prayer, you're a stranger to power. No, I'm telling you, we do not understand how important prayer is. The greatest source of power is prayer. Now, let me say that again because I want you to get it. If you really, truly want to experience power, the only way you're going to get it is through prayer. And prayers work, and that's why we won't do it, and that's why we don't have the power. Prayer. I'm going to show you in a moment exactly what God says about this. We must get sincere in this part of our Christian life. We need to labor at prayer. Labor, work. Put our shoulder to the wheel. We've not, the Bible says we have not because we ask not. 
<laughs> Why don't we ask? Because that's, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort to even think of what we might need to ask for. Work. At finding out what the need is of yourself and of somebody else. And that's the reason why, besides, if we enjoy giving to our kids, how much more our Father enjoys giving to us. Did you know that Isaiah solves the problem of unanswered prayer? Did you know Isaiah does? I'm going to turn to it. I want you to hear it. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to it with me. But go to Isaiah chapter number 59. Listen to this. Do you believe the Bible? Honestly. Now, hold on. Hold on a minute. Do you really believe this is the inspired Word of God and we are supposed to obey and practice it? Do you really believe that? If you believe it, let me tell you why we don't pray because it's labor. And here's the labor that's going to take answers to prayer. Listen to this. Isaiah chapter 59, and I'm going to read verse number 2. Listen. Listen to this. Isaiah, the prophet of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. And since we don't get any answers to prayer, he gives us the answer why. Because we don't labor at confessing our sins to have a relationship with him that the Holy Spirit can tell him what we need. And do you understand what that verse is saying? But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And it takes work and it takes labor to have the confession of our sins, as he calls the iniquities there. And then he says, and your sins have hid his face from you. That's where most Christians are, I'm telling you. We have... Christians that are filled with iniquity and sins. And the Bible says right there in that verse that He will not hear you. And when you don't get your prayers answered and you don't sense His presence and you don't experience His power, you know He's not hearing you, so you don't want to have to go through all of the efforts of trying to get a hold of God by confessing your sin and getting forgiveness to have that relationship that He will hear you. Boy, I'm telling you one thing. In recent days, just recently, I have seen, and I'm not bragging, by the way, and I am not perfect by any means, and I'm not the greatest Christian that's ever lived by any means. But I have found out how to get forgiveness of my sin, and I have found out how to get the power of God, and I have found out how to get a hold of the Lord and see in my faith His face and have Him hear me and answer me. Sometimes He says yes to me. Sometimes He says no. And sometimes He says I'll take care of it later. But I work at getting a hold of God by taking care of the iniquities that I'm involved in or have sinned and I confess them. Do you understand what this means? We have to confess our sins. And if we're not confessing our sins, we're not going to get a hold of God. Until we get on our face before God, we'll not get to see the face of God in prayer. Confess and forsaking our sin. There will be no answer to prayer until we do. Like it? No, most people will not. They want to say their little ditty and have their little devotion and just say once, uh, maybe a couple of minutes of some kind of a prayer and think they've done. No, sir. It takes work. It takes labor. It takes building yourselves unto the most holy faith. Either that or let's tear the pages out of this Bible, throw it in a trash can, let's all go out and get drunk. What do you think? Otherwise, if that Bible's right and God's name, we have to practice it. That's why he wrote it. I am so weary of Christians who do not act or perform as Christians. It takes labor to pray. I'm, I'm going to give you some things here. 
there will be no answer to prayer until we uh, take care of this matter. And that's just one verse in Isaiah. But let me tell you something. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel for a moment. And I'm going to turn over there and look at verse number, or chapter number 14. And again, if you've ever believed the Bible, believe this. Because it's in the Bible. It's inspired of God. I mean, the Old Testament and New Testament all are inspired by God. The Holy Spirit has had the prophets write these things down. And they wrote down as they were directed by the Holy Spirit to write them down so that we'll know what we're supposed to do. Now listen to me. Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse number 3. And I'm going to read it to you right now. Here it is. Here it goes. Son of man. These men have set up their idols in their heart. Oh, what's an idol? That's something that is more important than God. Money can be an idol. Pleasure can be an idol. Anything that takes your time and all that you have to, to energize yourself for is an idol to you. Your family could be an idol. Who's supposed to be first place in our lives? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Anything other than that is an idol to you. Your work can be an idol. Your money can be an idol. Your clothing can be an idol. Your house can be... What do you spend most of your time with and do? I'm trying to tell you something that most Christians will... I mean, this is the thing that separates me from a lot of Christians because I really believe this book. And look what that just said right there. These men have set up their idols in their heart. Now watch this. Listen to it. Same verse. And put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. And here's what God says in that same verse. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Should I be inquired of at all by them? In other words, they have their idol. They spend more time in their loving of sports and loving of money and loving of their house and loving of their family and loving of anything else than me. Should I be inquired at all by them? Now, come on. What's God trying to tell you? That thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Now, did he mean that or not? Why don't we get answers to prayer? There's your answer. In God's name. We need people today that can get answers to prayer, even for our own nation, for our church, for our family, for our pastor. We need answers to prayer. And there's going to be a time in the very near future because of the condition of the, uh, the world we're living in and in the condition of America that we're having, we're going to have to get on our faces before God and we're going to have to pray and we're going to have to work at praying to be able to even get our meals on the table if it continues to go on like it is right now. I know you don't like to hear that, but it's true. God's going to judge this nation, and in that judgment, He's going to include a backslidden Christian who won't labor at getting a hold of Him in prayer. I mean, what? Five minutes is not enough. Thank God I, I can pray, I can talk to God. He's invited me. He's given me access to His throne. And He speaks to my heart. And the Holy Spirit takes what He speaks to me about and puts it back in the ears of God as to what I really need. Mark that down and look at it yourself sometime. Ezekiel 14, verse 3. You mark it down. And like I said, Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. But that's not all. Listen to this. Then we see a, 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 another uh, in the New Testament, James chapter 4. Now, you're probably more familiar with this verse. I'm sure your pastor, whoever your pastor may be, would probably take some time and, 
and, and speak on this particular subject. It's a very, very important verse. I'm at uh, James chapter 4 and verse number 3. Listen to this. And you know that Dr. John R. Rice wrote a book that's Prayer is Asking, and it is. Asking God. But there's no use asking Him until we can have, have access to Him. But listen to this, chapter 14, verse, or chapter 4, verse 3. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. The word amiss there in the Greek is simply another word for evilly. You ask evilly that ye may consume it upon your lusts, your desires, not God's. This is what I want, God. This is what I want you to produce and present to me. Selfishly, we ask for things to consume upon our own lusts, our desires. How about asking for His power so we can be soul winners? How about asking Him to, to touch us in the areas of our bodies that need healing so the great physician can get the glory of what He said in Psalm 103, that He healeth all our diseases? How about that? But we ask amiss. We ask evilly. We, we ask for somebody else to be blessed or that we would be blessed by certain things that we would like to have for ourselves. That's exactly what he's saying. That's why we're not... Prayer takes labor. Prayer takes work. Here's something. Let me read this one. Listen, to, uh, I'm over in Mark chapter 11 right now in the, in the Gospels. My goodness. I'm, I want you to hear it. I realize it's, I mean, you may not ever listen to another message of, of mine again, but I want you to listen to this because I, I really believe the Bible and I really believe God wants you to believe the Bible as well in, in every area. And I'm not taking these out of context and I'm not ex expanding on them from my own uh, particular thoughts or anything. I'm telling you the truth exactly the way God said it. And listen to what he says in Mark 11. And I'm going to read verses 25 and 26. Here it is. And when we stand praying, so he's talking about prayer, forgive if ye have aught against any. In other words, forgive if you have something against some other Christian. Forgive. Notice what he says. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Because if he does not forgive you your trespasses because you did not forgive others who you have a trespass against, then God's saying, there's no use you praying because <laughs> the Heavenly Father is not going to forgive you your trespasses. Listen to this. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And I want to tell you something. I read it there in Isaiah 59. I read it there in the book of Ezekiel. I read it there in the book of James. And if you do, if you do not come clean with God and take care of these areas of the sin and iniquities in your life, God said, I'm not going to hear you. You know why you're not getting answers to prayer? And by the way, I'm telling you, in this day and age, there are some people I'm talking to right now, you need answers to prayer, even for loved ones. You need to have somebody maybe to be healed of God, or somebody needs to have a financial blessing, and, and, and you're praying for them, or maybe a marriage problem, or maybe there's a family that's got children going astray, and you're trying to pray for them. No use praying for them, according to this, until you get right with God. That's why, I mean, that's why the Bible talks about praying is work. It's labor, but my goodness, is it ever a blessing. Thank God for the prayer. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back to James for a moment here. Look at James chapter 1, if you want to turn there with me, if you've got your Bibles handy. I always like it when people follow along and look at the scripture that I'm reading so that they can see it with their own eyes and maybe apparently maybe that'll encourage them to believe it more. But listen to James chapter uh, uh, 1 and look at, look at verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask, that's prayer, let him ask of God 
that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, <laughs> driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Did you hear that verse? No, let that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If we waver about this matter of confessing our sin, if we waver about this matter of having faith, if we waver in this matter of, uh, of seeking forgiveness for somebody we have ought against, whatever it is that we waver against, if any man, listen, God has said plainly, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's why you're not getting answers to prayer. Prayer is work. We've got to be aligned with God and aligned with His Word and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us. It's work. Prayer is work. Here, our families are a mess. You understand that, don't you? Our, I'm talking about Christian families. The world is so bad that they don't even have families anymore. But I want you to know something. I want you to understand something. There is something in the Bible that we all need to take heed to. 1 Peter chapter 3, listen to the words. I'm going to read them. It says, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Listen to this. Likewise ye husbands. So he's talking both to the wife and now to the husband. Dwell with them, that's your wife, dwell with them according to knowledge. In other words, know how you can be a blessing, know how you can lead, know how you can be the spiritual leader, know what upsets them, know what they need, know how to take care of them, know how to provide for them, know how to encourage them according to knowledge. Listen to this, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now watch this and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You know what God's just saying right there? If your home life and your marriage is not according to the Word of God, you're not going to get any answers to prayer. He said it. He said it. Do you believe what He says? Do you really believe what he says? And here we're playing around with this matter. I'm simply saying we have got to come to the labor of praying and getting a hold of God, and there's only one way to do it, and that is to make sure that we are right with the Lord. Now, let me just tell you something, and I'll be done. I'm going to carry on maybe a little bit later at another message or so about this matter of what it takes for us to have the full power and presence and life of peace with God. The first thing I want to bring to your attention, I bring every time I ever have opportunity to preach, is that we need to be on the right side of God. And our sin, which we are sinners and we commit sins, and when we commit sins, if we are Christians, the Holy Spirit in us, as soon as we sin, brings guilt to our lives and tells us, uh-uh, you shouldn't have done that. You just sinned. You better get that right. Confess it. God says in 1 John 1, 9, if, it's conditional, if, if, which most Christians won't, but if we confess our sins, He is faithful, thank God. And listen, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin. But watch this next statement. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me explain to you again what that means. Whatever sin you've ever committed, unless you confess it, confess it it is still hanging on to you. You're still dragging it around in your life.
and you do not have forgiveness because you have to confess it before you get forgiveness and you have to uh, confess it before you get cleansed. And if you don't have forgiveness and if you don't get cleansed, then you don't have access to God in prayer. So you say, Brother Miller, what does it mean? Let me just give you a definition of confess. The definition of confess in the Bible and in the courtroom. I'm talking about the legal courtroom today in our courts of America. A confession from the one who's guilty lessens the penalty by the judge and by the jury. And many times they are set free or a lesser punishment. But with God, our confession is that we tell exactly to God what we're guilty of. That's confession. If I lie, I tell God who I lied to, what the lie was. I tell God where I was when I lied. I confess. In other words, I say the same thing that I'm guilty of. And as soon as I confess, I'm forgiven. Well, watch this now. And if I have sin in my life that I did not confess, and I've been carrying it along and I haven't had access to God, if I confess the ones that God has pointed out to me that I'm guilty of, are you listening? If I have God pointing out to me the sin that I'm guilty of and making me feel guilty and convicting me, if I'll truly repent of that sin and confess it to God and tell God I'm sorry, He will cleanse me from all the past sins. He says it. And he'll cleanse, if I confess, he'll cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now I've got access to God. I'm cleansed. I'm forgiven. I can speak to him. I can get my prayers answered. But there again, the prayer of confession is work. Now you don't have to confess all the sins that you're guilty of if you haven't confessed the ones that right now that you feel the presence of God convicting you about. One or two or three of them, whatever they might be. Confess them. And if you'll confess them, God will forgive you for them. And God will cleanse you from all those you did not confess in the past. And you have access to pray and get answers to your prayer. That's why the Bible is very clear. Prayer is work. But I want to tell you something. After having been saved for these 60-some years, it's worth the labor to have the presence, the power, the peace, the prosperity, and all of the things that God wants to give to me. Thank you for listening. God bless you. I hope it'll help. I'd like to hear from you, especially if you take what I just preached to you. Listen to it again in case you miss something. But take it and practice it and work at your prayer life. And you can have revival in your soul, in your family, and maybe even cause it to spread into the church. God bless you, friend. Thank you for, uh, for listening. I'll be back with you again. The Lord bless you now.